Hello and welcome to the Terran Space Academy, where we help prepare you for a bright future in the space industry. Please don't forget to like and subscribe, and support us on Patreon or at the Academy Store if you can. We appreciate you. I often look at the progress in Boca Chica and wonder, why did it take so long? What is so special about Starship? Why didn't someone else somewhere on this planet start building it decades ago? The Aerospike had to wait for new alloys and construction methods to be invented. But Starship is a large steel tank. Steel tanks have been around a long time. Had this idea occurred to anyone else? It had indeed. In the 1950s, researchers at Aerojet, TRW, and the Aerospace Corporation had released their concept of the utility of what they called the BDB. BDB stood for Big Dumb Booster. A scientist named Arthur Schnitt worked for the Aerospace Corporation in the 50s. Arthur had been chief engineer at Bell Aircraft and was a master of high temperature design. Arthur and others had pointed out the benefits of going big and simple back then, but he couldn't get anyone to listen. Arthur felt that it was a mistake to design and build rockets to aircraft specifications. Specifically, minimization of weight and maximization of performance. He developed a concept he called minimum cost design. He looked at the current Air Force and NASA projects at that time and found that they were prohibitively expensive and complicated. He thought the final cost of the space shuttle had proven his philosophy correct. He also pointed out that single stage to orbit rockets make no sense on Earth and said about the Venture Star project, I can only come to this conclusion. The SSTO program is meant to provide employment for the highly trained engineers and scientists. Just about everyone has been led to believe that advancing technology is great, without questioning whether their application appears promising. He even suggested that his advice was being ignored because it might cause some unemployment in the aerospace industry, and some work might be done by commercial industries. He concluded at a speech on launch costs in 1997 that immediate reductions by at least a factor of 10 are needed if a significant expansion of space activity is to be realized. Arthur died in 2010 at the age of 94. But before he died, he wrote a wonderful paper laying out his arguments. These were published on the internet in the 1990s. We put a link in the description. Let's see if these concepts sound familiar. Precept 1. It is cheaper to operate large rockets of simple design than to operate smaller, more complex ones. Precept 2. Minimum weight does not equal minimum cost. A cheap disposable heavy lift rocket is better than a medium-lift, reusable, expensive space shuttle. Another researcher who agreed with this philosophy was Lieutenant Colonel John London. Colonel London wrote a research report for the Air University titled, Leo on the Cheap, Methods for Achieving Drastic Reductions in Space Launch Costs, in 1994. His analysis proved that it is much cheaper per kilogram to get something really large into orbit with a big rocket. He continued by saying, it is difficult to imagine an expensive defense, civil, or commercial space endeavor when the cost of placing a kilogram into low Earth orbit today exceeds the cost of a kilogram of gold. Manned exploration initiatives will be difficult to afford when transporting a single meal to the U.S. space station will cost $15,000. Space launch is too expensive, and the U.S. will be handicapped in accomplishing national space policy objectives until drastic reductions can be achieved. To accomplish these reductions, researchers suggested the following. Use steel for the rocket structure. Build a massive rocket. Start with pressure-fed hypergolic engines and progress to pump-fed only when necessary. Keep the design as simple as possible. Most engineers at TRW, the Aerospace Corporation, and elsewhere read these reports and agreed. But engineers don't usually control the funding, and no one seemed interested in saving money. Before the space shuttle was canceled, the U.S. knew we needed something better. The shuttle, at about half a billion dollars per launch, was just not sustainable. The Space Launch Initiative was started to address this problem. The Space Launch Initiative was a joint NASA Department of Defense project to study the feasibility of a second-generation reusable launch vehicle. NASA established a goal of reducing costs while increasing safety and reliability. Simpler, more robust systems were designed. TRW even built and tested these. These are the TR-106 and TR-107. The TR-106 was called the Low-Cost Pintle Engine, or LCPE. 
It used liquid hydrogen and oxygen to produce 2,892 kilonewtons of thrust. This was a large, low-cost, easy-to-manufacture engine, using a single-element coaxial pintle injector. Since these would be thrown away, it used ablative cooling in the combustion chamber and nozzle, instead of the more complicated regenerative cooling systems. The simple injector design allowed it to be widely throttled. The TR-107 was an RP-1 version of the 106. There were plans to continue to a reusable staged combustion cycle engine, but development of the engines came to a stop when the Space Launch Initiative was cancelled. Whether a design lives or dies in the corporate world is not determined by its inherent worth to humanity, but by whether a committee decides it has enough political support to get government funding or make a quick profit. With cost plus contracting, there is no benefit to saving money. Cost plus means that the government will give you a certain percentage of what it costs you to develop the technology. Every dollar you save costs you money. Cheaper, more reliable, or reusable rocket engines were seen as a liability. The death of the TR engine series did not make everyone happy. The lead engineer working on the TR-106 was this man. This is Tom Mueller. Tom had worked for TRW for 15 years and felt that he was not being given the opportunity to maximize his talent. As a hobby, he began building his own engines in his garage at home and launched them on model rockets in the Mojave Desert. He later built the largest liquid-fueled hobby rocket engine ever constructed. This is what Tom was doing in 2002, when his work on home-built rocket engines caught the attention of this man. This was a crazy guy. His goal was not just profit. He wanted to go to Mars. But he had money, and if he would give Tom the chance to build the engine of his dreams, Tom was on board. We know the rest. The ideas Tom had not been able to realize before became first the Merlin engine, in many ways the pinnacle of affordable, reliable capability for an RP-1 fuel engine, and of course, the Raptor. The Raptor is an amazingly efficient rocket engine, but there is not a single concept utilized in the Raptor that is truly new. Methane was identified by Robert Goddard, the father of American rocket science as the optimum fuel for a reusable chemical rocket back in the 1920s, where thermal energy, clean burning, and power density intersect. The Raptor is a full-flow staged combustion engine, meaning there are two preburners. Most closed combustion rocket engines have only a fuel-rich preburner, as hot oxygen-rich gas is very destructive. But the Soviets had solved this problem long ago, perfecting the use of oxygen-rich preburners and turbopumps. A full-flow staged combustion engine will have one pump that is oxygen-rich and one that is fuel-rich. These preburners power individual turbo pumps, one optimized for oxygen and the other for fuel. This lesson goes into detail on these components, but while the Raptor is the first flying engine like this, it was not the first built. The RD-270 was a rocket engine designed and built by the Soviet Union. This was the world's first full-flow staged combustion rocket engine. It was designed in 1962 and developed through 1968. This was the largest rocket engine ever built in the Soviet Union. It was supposed to compete with the American F-1 that powered the Saturn V first stage to the moon. The RD-270 was a much more efficient design than the F-1. While the F-1 burned RP-1 with a specific impulse of about 265 seconds at sea level, the RD-270 used hypergolics. Like the F-1, the RD-270 had combustion instabilities. The Soviets could not solve this problem and canceled the engine in 1968. The United States learned to put dividers in the combustion chamber of the F-1 to solve this problem. The German Space Agency, at one time, had planned to build a space liner. This space liner is much closer to what the American space shuttle was supposed to be. Here we see an early American design compared to an early German design. Over the years, the concept changed to end up like this. This would have been a fully reusable spaceship. This is a vertical launch two-stage ship. After stage separation, the first stage would land horizontally to be reused, having reached an altitude of 75 kilometers and a velocity of 3.7 kilometers per second, while the second stage would continue on a ballistic flight for point-to-point -point hypersonic transport. The space liner would have room for two pilots and 50 passengers. It would reach a maximum altitude of 80 kilometers with a range of 18,000 kilometers and experience about 2.5 Gs on re-entry, reaching a maximum velocity of 7 kilometers per second, about Mach 24, using hydrogen, 
in an active cooling system on the leading edges to control heat buildup. Here you see two large rocket engines for the second stage, and nine more here on the first stage. This engine would have used liquid hydrogen fuel and was designed to be a full flow stage combustion cycle engine with a chamber pressure of about 160 bar and a specific impulse of 389 seconds at sea level and 449 seconds in vacuum. The maximum thrust would have been 2,268 kilonewtons, which is about 230 tons as Elon likes to use them. This project was updated as late as 2015, but was never fully funded. And that brings us to a quandary. The Starship is a large steel ship. Europe has some of the best shipbuilding companies on Earth, and Asia is not far behind. These companies routinely build massive ships, much more complicated than Starship. But it turns out that the European Space Agency does everything by committee. Committees are great at keeping you from making a mistake, as it is unlikely that everyone will have the same blind spot. They are also great at keeping you from making progress, as everyone will have a different opinion on how to succeed. To have rapid revolutionary progress, you need just the right person, in just the right place, with just the right resources. A talented individual, given the authority to control a project, can do great things. Remember the Delta Clipper project, led by astronaut Pete Conrad. And that brings us back to the SpaceX Starship. Taking a talented engineer like Tom Mueller and giving him the resources and authority to create was one of the smartest things Elon has ever done. Once you have a great product, you need a great business person to market the product and get contracts. This was Gwen Shotwell. She ran SpaceX and marketed the Falcon rocket system, making it a huge success. And this is why Starship could only be built in America. The concept of putting so much trust in one individual is not common to any other nation. If you don't choose the right person, things will go very wrong. But in the United States, the government does not choose the person. The person rises to the top by merit. By allowing these people to build access to a brilliant team and enough resources, we can accomplish what no one else ever could. The Starship could have been built by the Soviet Union in the 1970s, the Europeans in the 1990s, or the Asians today. But because of bureaucratic inertia and lack of leadership, they have not. One person can make a difference, if it's the right person at the right time. Something to think about. Thanks for listening. Please don't forget to like and subscribe, and stay safe. At Astro Proterra.